Hi everyone, this is Dr. Jess Rafford from Wilkes University. Welcome to uh, the Conservation Biology class, Bio 340. This discussion is on pollution. Okay, uh, the first definition, pollutants. These are elements of the environment that negatively affect fitness. So they decrease survivorship or they decrease reproduction. And they're also put in the environment by people, okay? So these can be uh, natural or synthetic. And to give you a topic in the news recently, uh, carbon dioxide is completely natural, but it's considered a pollutant when it has negative effects. Uh, toxins are chemicals that negatively affect organisms. So, uh, also affecting fitness, so survivorship or reproduction. And so they can be natural or synthetic as well. All right, but when it's at levels, so I have here an example is zinc. It's not synthetic, it's a mineral that's out there in rocks. Uh, but it can be a pollutant when it negatively affects um, organisms at toxic levels. Okay, and then we have contaminants. These are chemicals that occur at levels or locations that are not natural. So uh, zinc is out there in the world. Humans have nothing to do with uh, most of the natural occurrences of zinc, but when we concentrate it into an area, uh, then it becomes a contaminant. So all those definitions are pretty close. Uh, but it's important to discriminate between them. Also, uh, you'll see in the literature on pollution is point versus non-point source pollution. Point source is a, um, is a producer of pollution that has a clear identifiable source. So you can point to that one thing that is causing the pollution. And so the classic cases are smelters. Smelters are uh, factories that concentrate uh, minerals and metals. Okay, so a zinc smelter, copper smelter, uh, these are common. Landfills um, are producers of, of pollution, um, or can be, I should say, mines and farms. Non-point source is when the pollutant is produced in a dispersed fashion. And um, so singly, uh, something that produces pollution may not be harmful, but altogether, uh, those sources may be harmful uh, when additive. So I have here cars and uh, any individual car may not produce uh, enough pollution that would be harmful, but when you take a city full of cars, uh, then you can produce pollution. When uh, they're all dripping or many are dripping a little bit of oil, collectively, that could be a lot of oil, okay? Another example would be yards and fertilizer where any particular yard uh, isn't uh, producing a lot of pollution through uh, run off of fertilizers, but a city or large sub suburb may produce enough runoff that um, all those fertilizers in the water system may uh, produce issues. If we look at the fate of pollutants in organisms, there's a few things that they can, that can happen and these are not um, mutually exclusive uh, endpoints. So they can be metabolized, metabolized. So you can take in a toxin such as alcohol, right? If you take enough, you die. If you take less than that, you can get sick. Um, but if you, if you drink alcohol, ethanol, it can be metabolized and it can be converted into a form that can be excreted. And this is true of sort of the classic pollutants such as mercury, and uh, DDT. So they can be taken in the body and excreted. They can be stored and what that means is they go into your body and they stay in your body. So many pollutants are both. 
So for example, mercury you take in, right? It actually comes down on food and uh, is unfortunately all around us at this point. And uh, you take a little bit in and then your body's able to excrete it. It actually comes out in your hair. Uh, some in your urine, but uh, much of it in your hair and four birds, for example, can come out in your feathers. If that pollutant is stored faster than it's metabolized, okay? So this is, you pour a little bit in, you pour a little bit out, but if you pour a lot in, uh, your body will often store these and that is called bioaccumulation. So bioaccumulation is when a pollutant is stored at the individual level, okay? So if I happen to, for whatever reason, let's say I'm eating high up on the food chain and um, I'm going outside and eating walleye out of the Susquehanna here, and that's all I'm eating, I will have an input of mercury much faster than I can excrete it, so it will accumulate in my tissues. You also have this other phenomenon called biomagnification. And so the reason why mercury is high in say walleye, it's because it's eating uh, smaller fish that have concentrated mercury as well. And those fish ate uh, say plankton and invertebrates in the water that have accumulated a little bit of mercury. And what happens is it builds up in the body each level. So the levels below have less concentration and the levels above have much, much higher concentration. And the classic case uh, that is well documented is the example of DDT, where each trophic level, so that's who eats who, every time it bumps up, it's, it's concentrated in the body many, many magnitudes over. And uh, I'll give you an example. So this would be from the 1970s. So you, uh, if you looked at the water at the time, uh, it, it would appear to be relatively clean, okay? So the, the parts per million was point, let me make sure I get this right, point zero, 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 three, okay? So not much in the water, you could probably drink the water and be relatively safe. But plankton that lives in the water, uh, their bodies would uptake the DDT and concentrate it in their bodies. Now it's at 0.04 parts per million, okay? And the small fish that are eating the plankton, they concentrate that higher level in those in their bodies and make it even higher. So they're at 0.5 parts per million. And then those small fish are eating by larger fish. Okay, so let's say a walleye or a bass. And then it's two parts per million. And then an osprey swoops down in this picture, would swoop down, eat a walleye, eat a bass, and they are now concentrating DDT in their body at 25 parts per million. And that is 25 million times the original concentration, which is really outrageous. But this is, this is what happens uh, through trophic interactions and biomagnification. So uh, to give you some context on what this means is that historically we would uh, feel very comfortable uh, dumping pollutants in waterways and in smokestacks, just, just releasing things. But it ends up that even dilute amounts uh, get returned to the ecosystem in very high concentrations through trophic interactions that tend to concentrate these pollutants. So the solution to pollution is not dilution. Okay, let's get into specific cases. Acid rain is, we'll just define it as precipitation with low pH. And what this can do is when that rains on areas, it can leach out minerals and nutrients out of the soil. So there are, for example, less calcium for insects and birds rely on getting calcium and putting calcium into their eggs from eating insects. And so it's passed up the food chain. If there's 
less calcium in insects, there's less calcium available for eggs, so we know that there's eggshell thinning as a result of acid rain. There's fewer nutrients for plants, and we know that um, in places where acid rain is a problem, it can actually kill plants. And the low pH can affect fish uh, that are particularly sensitive, such as trout. Okay. So acid rain is, is much improved in the US. I mean, it got to a problem where uh, we're seeing widespread uh, effects of acid rain in lakes and streams and in forests, uh, but it's still improved, but it's still an issue, particularly on the West Coast, as this USGS map shows. And what, what happens is uh, smelters and burning out west uh, produces nitrous oxides and sulfur oxides, okay? Sulfur oxides go up in the air and uh, they come down and produce acid rain. So most weather systems go from west to east. So the uh, acid rain that's produced out west then falls on east. So you can see that pH of precipitation in 2002, uh, that the pH drops significantly on the East Coast. And it actually gets uh, much lower as you move up in elevation. So along the Appalachian Ridge, uh, that's where you see the effects of uh, acid rain the, the most, okay? And I just have a picture here. Here's a uh, smelter. So that's kind of what they look like. Okay, ozone. Ozone is bad and good. In the stratosphere, in the upper atmosphere, that's called the stratosphere, it's, it's a good thing. It blocks UV, which is good for us, right? Because UV uh, is mutagenic, so it, it causes cancer and it also causes skin burns. Uh, so blocking a lot of it is actually very useful. In the troposphere, which is where we live, uh, ozone is a strong oxidizer. And that's bad because it damages tissue. So it can cause, uh, it can irritate lungs and it also damages plant tissue. So uh, it's a, it, right now it's an unrecognized or underappreciated form of pollution uh, for plants and agriculture. And then ozone uh, in the troposphere can combine with things like nitrous oxides and volatile organic compounds and uh, it produced things like smog, okay? And uh, when I lived in Auburn, which is about 90 miles from Atlanta, we would have uh, days, uh, hot days, work days, when there's lots of people driving and it was over 90 degrees, you would have uh, days where you should not go outside and breathe the air, especially if you have something like asthma. And ozone is a global problem. So this just isn't a problem for our Southern cities. It's a problem for cities um, around the globe, particularly where it's warm. So here's a, a map of uh, ozone damage in plants. And you can see uh, as you get towards the poles, less of a problem, but definitely a problem in uh, in the Northern hemisphere in the South and then in the Southern hemisphere uh, towards the equator. All right, so this leads us to chlorofluorocarbon CFCs. These were used as uh, propellants and refrigerants. And so you can still find them every once in a while, little cans that people put in their cars to uh, refresh the coolants in their air conditioners. CFCs, when they're released, they are a catalyst. So it takes a tiny bit of amount of them uh, to interact in the atmosphere. When they get up into the stratosphere, they actually break down ozone. So if they could break down ozone in the troposphere, we'd be fine, but they break down ozone in the stratosphere. And as I just pointed out in the previous slide, that means uh, we are more exposed to UV rays and it ends up that there was an ozone hole that formed over Antarctica and it didn't take a lot, like I said, a lot of CFCs to break down ozone because it's a catalyst, so it's just recycled. 
and uh, you formed an ozone hole over Antarctica. And uh, so that was a place where UV light pollution was a particular problem. What happened is uh, we recognized this problem across the globe and we came to an agreement, which is called the Montreal Protocol in 1985, and we banned the use of CFCs. So that take, took international coordination because if one country uh, banned it, you could have other countries still selling it. So it took uh, international collaboration to, to all agree to uh, stop using CFCs. All right, now we're gonna get into metals. And metals are uh, toxic when they're in the body. Um, many metals, I should say, are toxic when they are in the body just above what we consider minute amounts. Some metals we need, so they are enzyme cofactors. They work with enzymes and they do exceedingly important functions uh, such as in the nervous system. And what metals will do is they'll replace a needed uh, metal and they'll replace it with another metal, but that does not perform its function in the body. So you can bump a magnesium out with something like lead, but lead does not perform that same function in the body. All right. With lead, its source are things like smelters. So the, the extracting metals from rocks, when you heat them up very high, can release lead, uh, gunshot, and then you have residual lead and paint. And it was also a gas additive. Now we don't use lead and paint anymore or in gas, uh, but because it's a metal, it never breaks down. And if you ever buy or sell a house, you'll have to have a statement if there is lead paint in your house. Uh, the thing about lead is it tends to stay local. And what I mean by that is it doesn't get up in the air and uh, become a global problem. It stays more or less local. Can be a problem in waterways, but ground contamination is a big thing. Uh, where gunshot is used, uh, this tends to be wetlands where you don't have flowing water or it gets into the soil as well. It causes developmental and neurological damage. Um, and it uh, accumulates in the bone. And this is one of those uh, contaminants you do not metabolize well. So it's very hard to get rid of. It goes in your bone and can stay there. And if you have any problems uh, with your diet and you start losing bone, you can actually be exposed to lead this way as well. Uh, it doesn't take much for birds to die. Five lead pellets from shot uh, will kill a bird. And I don't mean five pellets going into the body from it shooting. I mean birds like mallards and geese that are eating vegetation at the bottom of wetlands. If they happen to ingest uh, a few pellets, they can die. And so a lot of states and uh, federal game areas now require copper shot and that improves things. Okay, mercury, uh, its source is uh, coal burning. So there are minute amounts of mercury and coal and it comes out when you burn coal for uh, electrical production. It's also an industrial waste. So we use mercury, mercury a lot in the past. Uh, unlike lead, it's a global issue because it gets uh, up into the stratosphere. So when you, you burn coal and mercury comes out of the smokestack and get up into the stratosphere and move around the globe. And just like CFCs, um, whatever air currents, whatever they do, it tends to concentrate mercury up along the poles. Although it is a global issue, it tends to be worse in the poles. So just because of bio uh, magnification, you see uh, mercury, high levels of mercury and high up in the food web, such as uh, orca and polar bears. Uh, like lead, it causes developmental and neurological problems. And it's excreted through hair, feathers, and pee. So uh, you, you get rid of it, it's not stored in your bone, it comes out in hair, feather, and pee. 
Uh, but like I mentioned in early on is you will bioaccumulate mercury if you are ingesting much faster than you are excreting. So it, it has become a problem in, in many organisms. Uh, I wanna point out that elemental mercury is not an issue. So um, elemental mercury is just Hg by itself. So it, it's a red color, it's used in thermometers. Well, it used to be uh, much more common in thermometers. Uh, what happens is when, let's say mercury comes out of a smokestack, it'll go on the ground and bacteria will metabolize this mercury and turn it into methyl mercury. And methyl mercury is very dangerous. That's the stuff that causes all the neurological issues. And just I have here on as a side note, uh, mercury is part of thimerosal, right? So you actually inject mercury into the body, uh, but it's attached to a very large molecule and becomes thimerosal. And this is a uh, preservative in vaccines and it's not absorbed by the body. You actually excrete uh, thimerosal very quickly, actually. Other metals, uh, so lead and mercury are the real big ones that are global issues, global problems, although it might be local, uh, such as lead. It's the extent of it across the globe, so many local issues. Uh, the other metals are zinc and cadmium. Uh, again, they come out of smelters, right? When you heat a rock up, it's just gonna give off everything. And these are toxic when higher than in micro amounts, like lead and mercury. Uh, cadmium, we know can thin eggshells. And uh, I just added this after the fact that mercury is also an issue in illegal gold mines. It's used to uh, extract gold. So a lot of people that are working in these uh, illegal gold mines are exposed to mercury pollution. All right, moving on from metals to uh, what is essentially oil polyaromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs. So the source, you have uh, non-point sources such as leaky oil pans. So this is, uh, you've probably seen this sheen that you get from oil leaking on top of the road. And also from point uh, source such as uh, oil, oil spills. PAHs are, um, they are, persistent in the environment. Uh, so the oil itself will turn into droplets and then the droplets itself can be incorporated into organisms, particularly filter feeders such as oysters and uh, mussels. Uh, if oils get on feathers, the birds drown. So birds actually put on waterproofing. Uh, so ducks, like water off a duck's back, it's because they have a gland that produces uh, waterproofing material and uh, oils will remove that, uh, the, what's called preening oil. So birds actually get wet and then they can drown. Uh, we know that um, PAHs can bioaccumulate. We're not sure how well they biomagnify and we also don't know well how these things affect organisms. All right, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, uh, these were used um, in electronic parts as insulators. Uh, many of them, not all of them, but many of them were banned in the 1970s and uh, they are highly persistent. So the, they're very stable molecules. And even though they were banned in the 1970s, uh, it's still an issue, even in Pennsylvania. So if you uh, just Google, uh, fish consumption warnings, Pennsylvania, you'll see that many of our rivers have either mercury or PCB warnings, and it's because of the industrial runoff and pollution. Uh, and these cause neurological issues in, in organisms as well. Uh, let's get to pesticides. So pesticides came in two flavors. You had organochlorine pesticides, and organophosphate pesticides. So the organochloride that was widely used was DDT. And uh, this was widespread. And when I say widespread, I mean they load up planes and would mist 
uh, fields. Uh, it was used in wetlands to control mosquitoes. It's been banned. In fact, it was banned in uh, the mid 1970s and they still use malaria, uh, DDT to control malaria in high malaria zones. So in places like India and Africa, it's now used locally. And uh, the banning of DDT gets blamed for uh, the death of millions of people because uh, if you're not controlling mosquitoes, they can transmit malaria. But what was happening, and often what you don't hear from people, is that mosquitoes were becoming uh, resistant to DDT. So you could spread, use widespread DDT and uh, you were actually selecting for DDT resistant mosquitoes. So at some point we would have to stop using it anyway. Um, it's extremely persistent. You can still uh, take a shovel full of dirt in Pennsylvania and 40 years later you can still find uh, DDT and its metabolite DDE. Uh, both of these um, bioaccumulate, biomagnify, as pointed out early on. And um, the example I used before were osprey. Their populations plummeted, but also bald eagles um, and brown pelicans and peregrine falcons. So these birds that um, eat high up in the food chains and peregrine falcons, for example, eat the birds that are eating the fish uh, in those food chains. Bald eagles and peregrines were lost from the lower 48 states. So there were remnant populations high up uh, in Canada and Alaska. There might have been a few bald eagles left in Florida. But uh, for example, at one time, uh, not that long ago, you would not find bald eagles uh, or peregrine falcons in Pennsylvania. So it was really bad and now that we banned DDT, their populations are booming. In fact, uh, we just removed the peregrine falcon from the, uh, the threatened list, so it's been bumped up, so, which is great. Uh, so we banned DDT, and this was a pesticide used in agriculture to keep insects from eating our food. So when you remove something, you have to replace it with another. Uh, so we replaced it with organophosphates, also called carbamates. These are less persistent, so that's great. However, they are neurotoxic even to mammals. That's bad. Uh, so we, again, uh, just like DDT, we ban the widespread use and now can be used locally. In fact, carbamates are used on birds uh, for for avian pests such as starlings and red-winged blackbirds when their populations get too high. Uh, farmers are allowed to uh, spray flocks and they tend to be organophosphates. Okay, so then we banned organophosphates. So what's next on the list? And that would be neonicotinoids and uh, like the word says, um, it means new nicotine, uh, anything that ends in oid means to be like, but these are synthetic molecules that are like nicotine. Plants produce nicotine because it's a, it's a natural um, pesticide, keeps insects from eating it. And like if you have too much nicotine, you get the jitters, imagine you're a grasshopper and getting the same amount, you would also be jittery or just dead. Uh, they're not very persistent, uh, but they are highly effective. They're used in agriculture and gardening. And in fact, they may be too effective and um, that they go beyond their target. So if you have a plane or you are spraying uh, neonics across the landscape, they can, they can blow around or get into the water and they may be too effective because we've been losing large insects and, and we're not sure why. Neonics were blamed for the loss of honeybees, but uh, it ends up that's likely not neonics, although in some cases we know it is. Uh, and they are bad for pollinators when they're pollinating near agricultural fields, but widespread loss of honeybees is probably not due to neonics. 
And, and so if neonics are not going to be used, we have to come up with something else. And uh, we'll get to a chapter on sustainable agriculture where integrated pest management is where you use a little bit of everything and not too much of any one thing. Okay, moving on. Endocrine disrupting compounds are, these are things that get into the body and then cause uh, disruptions to the endocrine system, which produces the hormones. So it's, the, these can be bad and produce developmental effects. So uh, the common one out there, the common chemicals out there are brominated flame retardants. These are used in things like um, cushions, that are used in cars uh, and uh, it's kind of good that we have flame retardants because uh, it slows down fires. You don't want to use anything that would uh, accelerate a fire, especially in a car. Uh, but the problem is these things get into the environment and we know they're increasing in humans. Uh, we're just not sure of the effects. Uh, Bisphenol A and phthalates are in plasticizers. And um, so for example, uh, here's my water bottle, nice and hard. Doesn't have any of these things such as in, uh, let's see, what do I have? You have some plastics that uh, bend and to get them to bend you need to uh, insert other chemicals because plastics are brittle. So like my headphones have these chemicals in them. You also have uh, bioaccumulation effects. So these things get into your body and uh, they'll accumulate in, in fat in particular. And we're not sure of the effects. There's uh, some blame on uh, breast cancer on these things, but we're, I would say we're just not sure. So you cannot experiment on a human, so we have to do some uh, post hoc studies. Uh, eutrophication is uh, when you put too much uh, nutrients, you overload the system with nutrients. And uh, we are doing that in some water systems primarily due to agricultural waste. So when animal feces from chickens, cows, and pigs in particular go into the water system, uh, it, can, it can overwhelm the system. And the same is true for residential use of fertilizers. Uh, so when you see the guy out and uh, putting fertilizer on his lawn, uh, a lot of that will run off into the water systems. And what happens is, these nutrients getting to aquatic ecosystems and you get an algal bloom, B-L-O-O-M. And so you get an algal bloom where the algae population just explodes, but then they die. And when they die, uh, they remove all the oxygen from the water. And that's not uh, good for anything like fish that requires lots of oxygen. Uh, this is a problem in the Chesapeake and um, the, in the Mississippi, in fact, the Mississippi has an area called the dead zone and it moves around because the, the water currents will move around. Uh, but this is at the mouth of the Mississippi going towards Texas that uh, you'll get these algal blooms. All right, getting towards the end, litter and microplastics and pharmaceuticals. We know that uh, litter, although it looks very bad, it causes little physical harm, although I would say it's very specific to certain species such as sea turtles. Uh, it does cause aesthetic problems, so it does look terrible. So big litter, I would say, is not that big of a problem. It's actually the litter you don't see. So when microplastics break down, um, they produce microplastics and they can actually be, become bioaccumulated and organisms and we don't really know what they do. Okay. And then there are pharmaceuticals. So people either dumping directly their drugs into the toilet or actually another thing is that you can take drugs and then when you urinate and flush the toilet, those metabolized pharmaceuticals can still be an issue and get into the waterways that way. 
So that is uh, pollution. If you have any questions, please be sure to email me and I'll be happy to, to uh, answer anything.